Hello, everyone. I hope that you're seated comfortably because we're going to talk about one of the most beautiful theorem, the first fundamental theorem of calculus. That theorem links the notion of indefinite integrals and the notion of definite integrals. So remember, indefinite integrals, we're referring to families of antiderivatives of functions. Meanwhile, definite integrals, roughly speaking, we're referring to the area under the graph of a function over a, an interval. So the terminology is very similar. The notation is very similar. But initially, those two concepts are completely different. But the first fundamental theorem of calculus links the two things together. So here it is. So suppose we have a function defined over AB, and suppose that big F is a primitive for that function over that interval AB, then the definite integral of F of X over the interval AB, or the integral from A to B of F of X dx, is the value of big F at B minus the value of big F at A. Wow. This is completely messed up because if you look at this theorem, it simply says that, yes, if you are trying to find the definite integral of a function, yes, you could go crazy and use the limit definition if you're really in the mood, or if you happen to have a primitive for that function, forget about all that bullshit. You can just compute the output of that primitive at the upper bound minus the output of that primitive at the lower bound. And just by computing f of b minus f of a, you get the exact same thing. So of course, of course, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over two examples where we use the limit definition of the definite integral, in particular using the right theorem to compute the value of those definite integrals. But now we're going to do it again using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. First example, let's compute the integral from 0 to 4 of x squared dx. So the first step, the way I like to do it, is first you forget about the bounds. You just see this as initially an indefinite integral question. So we know that the family of antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3 plus c. So that's the first step. You forget about the bounds. You compute the indefinite integral. Little friendly warning here. Of course, my examples right now are very straightforward, but in general, you might have to use a technique of integration to find that family. So these questions can blow up in your face pretty quickly. Anyway, so that's the family. The second step is just to use one primitive. So typically I use the one where c is zero. So let's define f of x as being simply x cubed over three. You could use x cubed over three plus 17, whatever turns you on here, uh, they will all work. But you just need one. So typically, if you want to simplify your life, just use the one where C is zero. And now here we go. So third step here. So if you want to compute the definite integral of x squared between zero and four, of x squared between zero and four, well, by the first fundamental theorem of calculus, this is what I'll write as FTC one, it's f at 4 minus f at 0. I know what big F is here. So it's 4 cubed over 3 minus 0 cubed over 3. 4 cubed over 3, that's 64 over 3 minus 0. That's the answer. I really want to take the time to compare the numerical value of th that we obtain by using the first fundamental theorem of calculus and using the limit definition. So if we go back to our example, our example 4.3.9, we are like, we have here the whole computation that led us to also 44 over three, 64 over three, sorry. So very, very different solution here. Um, if we are asking you to do it using the limit definition, you have to do it using example like we did in example 4.3.9,
But if you're asked to do it using the fundamental theorem of calculus, find a family of primitives, just use one, and then use FTC1 to get the value. And the solution is like, ah, oh, it's so, so cool. All right, next example. Let's compute the integral from minus 0 0.5 to 2 of 0 0.5 x cubed minus x squared plus 2. So the first step is to first compute the indefinite integral. So you forget about the bounds. So first step, let's compute the integral 0 0.5 x cubed minus x squared plus 2. So here, this is a simple uh, polynomial. So you're just going to use the power rule. So you're going to get 0 0.5 x4 over 4 minus x cubed over 3 plus 2x plus c. That's the full family. The second step is just to define one. Let's use f of x equals, so typically I use a one where c is 0, so I'm going to use 0 0.5 x4 over 4 minus x cubed over 3 plus 2x. I define a specific f. And now the third step is to now compute the definite integral using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So now I know that the integral between minus 0 0.5 and 2 of 0 0.5x cubed minus x squared plus 2 dx using the first fundamental theorem of calculus, this is what I call FTC1, it's going to be f at the upper bound, so 2 minus f at the lower bound, so minus 0 0.5. And actually, if you do it, this will be equal to 4.283854161, etc. So periodic, and of course, again, again, look at this answer. And if you go back to the example uh, three, four point three point ten, we got that number earlier. But of course, when you look at the solution of four point three point ten versus the solution of this example uh, using the first fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, we're not talking about the same level of difficulty. This is such a this is so beautiful this is this is amazing I, I like and of course this is the connection and all the terminology and notation came after this theorem and there's a, there's a reason why we use the word indefinite integral or different integrals or we use the same notation like without bounds or with bounds um, it's because of that theorem there is a link but we are initially talking about two different things but this theorem just merges the two so beautiful stuff let's do a new example so next example, let's compute the integral from 1 to 5 of ln of x dx. Again, the first thing you do when you have a definite integral, you forget about the bounds. So we're going to first compute the indefinite integral. So let's just integrate ln of x dx. If you want to compute this integral, you're going to get x ln of x minus x plus c. For this one, you need by parts. Okay, so I'm not... Just giving it to you, but you need to use whatever techniques. So in this case here, uh, the integral of ln of x is just x ln of x minus x plus c. The second step is to define one primitive. So I'm going to use, as usual, c equal to 0. So I'm going to use f of x as x ln of x minus x. And now for the definite integral, so the third step, if you want to compute the integral between 1 and 5, of ln of x dx by using the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So I like to write this up on top. So here by using the fundamental theorem of calculus one, I know it's going to be f at the upper bound. So f at five, so big F at five minus big F at the lower bound. So you're going to get five ln of five minus five minus, open a bracket, 1, ln of 1, which is 0, minus 1. So if you simplify all this, you're going to get 5, ln of 5, minus 4. 
So that's your final answer. If you want the decimal value, this is very close to 4.047189. Etc. So again, here and this example is very interesting because if you try to use the limit definition, even with the right theorem, this question is like very, very difficult, very, very challenging. You need tools that we haven't talked about. Basically, if you don't start with a polynomial, you cannot really use the limit definition to compute um, the definite integral. So you need the fundamental theorem of calculus, the first fundamental theorem of calculus to compute its value. All right, let's end this section with a bunch of remarks, very important remarks. Of course, all of them are super important remarks. The first remark, the first fundamental term of calculus basically changes the nature of the problem. Initially, computing a definite integral means computing a crazy limit. And of course, we hate computing crazy limits. So this first fundamental term of calculus says, well, if you can find a primitive, you're good. And of course, at this point, if you're comfortable with techniques of integration, you have a lot of tools to go and find one of those primitive. But we also know that this can be quite difficult. And maybe for some functions, because we haven't seen all techniques, maybe for some functions, it might not be possible because it needs to be clear that the true power of the first fundamental term of calculus relies on the fact that you have a primitive, but if you don't have a primitive, you cannot use the first fundamental theorem of calculus. It becomes completely pointless. So you need to make sure that there is a primitive before you go on a quest. I want to find a primitive. You want to make sure that there's a primitive out there waiting for you before you go and you start seeking one. So we need some sort of guarantee that there is a primitive out there. Because if not, this first fundamental term of calculus is completely pointless. And of course, of course, there is a theorem that says that there's always a primitive. And that theorem is called the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And this will be the topic of the next section. But anyways, for that very beautiful first fundamental theorem of calculus, that's it. That's all. Bye-bye,